Welcome to the Love Cars on the Grid podcast, your global motorsport roundup with me, Tiffany Dell and Paul Woodman. Welcome Where are you anyway? Wake Sorry. up, wake up. It's episode 26 of Love Cars on the Grid, your global motorsport roundup podcast. <laughs> and it's a quite an exciting one, I've got to say, because we're going to kick off with all the controversy, with all the excitement. Monza, the Grand Prix, Formula One. Oh, oh it was what happened, Tiff Nadell. Here we go again and again and again. <laughs> I mean, I think this time, you know, the, the vast majority, despite Martin Brundle's original It's a Race Instant and a few other pundits, it was a, a professional foul, Paul. Let's, I mean, I, you know, I think Toto said it was a deliberate, you know, attack. But I mean, you and me are football fans, and we know there's this famous thing that's called the professional foul, taking one for the team. But even the football pundits, oh, he had to, he had to take one for the team. Which means Where, you know, if, somebody's, if somebody's clear on the goal, and then you... Pack him down. If you, you're, you're only going to get a yellow card, so you take one for the team. If you, obviously you already have a yellow card, you can't do it, which is why I think in football it should be a red card for these ridiculous. But when the professional pundits like it, oh yeah, you had to take one for the team. And um, basic to me, you know, it's all going back to Silverstone the same. It's what's in each driver's mind as that moment of impact. You know, the Silverstone one was Lewis wanted to keep the momentum up to try and overtake on the next thing, and, and Max wanted to shut the gap as much as possible, you know. And it, it all happened in a mill- millimetre of a second, and they, they touched. Uh, but on this occasion, you know, Max has had this terrible pit stop that's cost him, I don't know what the problem was, uh, you know, eight seconds. 11.6 seconds. Was it 11? I'm oh, sorry, yeah. pit stop, man. Sorry, you know, all the time, so... <laughs> And actually, unfortunately for Lewis, he had a four second or something. Otherwise, this would never have happened, you know, if, if the uh, Mercedes pit stop had gone correctly. But, you know, I think Max has come in there and he's seen Lewis coming out of the pit lane and, and he's just thinking, you know, I can't, I can't let him get ahead. If he gets ahead, he's going to score more points than me. I can't let him get ahead. So he's got that sort of almost desperation in his mind. And I think he gets to that corner and he thinks, well, he's ahead, he's ahead. So instead of, you know, missing the corner out as every other driver would do in those circumstances. You know there's a huge launch pad ahead of you. You know there's a great sausage curb straight in front of you. Uh, and if you look at the pictures, you know, um, um, Lando just ahead of Lewis is where Lewis is going. You know, it's the normal line everyone takes. And so he just decided, it was going back to the sort of arrogant Max kid that we all began with two or three years ago. You know, we were a bit worried about him making bold moves. And I think he just said, well, I'm going in there. And he doesn't. He well, doesn't yield. Whatever happens, Max, happens. You Max know. Verstappen is one of the most talented drivers we've ever seen ever, uh, but he doesn't yield. He does not give in. He thinks that he's better, bigger, more important than anyone else. He does not yield. It's as simple as that. But he must have known there'd been a collision there. You know? He just. He just put it in there. Well, look at Lewis. He, I mean, his you know, first it. comment in the car on the radio. Didn't he say something? Well, that's what happens if if you don't give room or something, you know? Yeah, but it's always, of course, but no. with it being a driver, it's always the other person's fault. But Lewis, lap one, corner four, did exactly what he, what Max probably should have done. And bailed out, yeah, bailed, bailed out. out. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Was, I mean, I was, you know, the, the track limits thing, my rule is, you know, there's a concrete wall there. And, you know, you wouldn't have tried to go round the outside. And turn. It's a stupid chicane anyway. I hate the corner. Um, <laughs> and I hate I hate tight chicanes. There's two of them at Monza, which, you know, to me, Monza, everyone raise up Monza. Oh, let's all go to Monza. So fast. We, oh, well, that's because there's so many straights. And the average speed is very fast. But, you know, they've got these two horrendous. But, no, you know, if there was a concrete wall there, he wouldn't have tried to do what he did. Um, anyway, Ed, I'm was, sorry, but I'm right was, with I mean, you know, Damon Hill was quite strong. And I think you know, nowadays it's almost, wow, blooming hell, someone's made a strong opinion. That was deliberate. You know, people were quite shocked, I think, what Damon said. But I think he was right. I think see, it's a I bit like see, Schumacher. Schumacher took him out, you know, in, in Adelaide all those years ago with one of the... I don't think it was deliberate. Him. I think it was arrogance. I don't think it was a deliberate... Perfect, I actually disagree with you. I don't think it's a professional foul. I think it was pure arrogance that he's bigger and better than anyone else and Lewis has to get out but of Lewis, his way. OK. He believed Lewis was moved out of the way. Yeah, in your head. yeah, that's that's what I thought. Yeah. And, and he, you know, Lewis had had more to lose than him. Hence, why Max could afford to do it. But as it happens, Max, you know, how close is it? It's incredible. They got uh, they got penalty points taken off, and very exciting. But you know what? With every bit of drama and controversy and uh, and sadness for for two drivers, 
Look at the other two drivers that were absolutely <laughs> elated with what happened. Of course, Lando Norris and Daniel <laughs> Ricciardo. Amazing. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. It was just, it's a shame for Lando, I think. He's led that team through know. You know, from the bottom of the That was his win. That was it, his win. I know. <laughs> He's dominated Ricciardo all year. And then all of a sudden, you know, Daniel gets a good weekend. He had a good weekend. He was on top of the McLaren's all through Monza. And that one race, you know, when... But I think it's a bit like, you know, everyone was right. Radicanu had the sports headlines of the of the year. But I think, um, well, probably the decade, probably the century, Radicanu's been we absolutely stunning. I think motorsport did its best to uh, upstage uh, Radicanu for coming up with an amazing shock result. Yeah, I'd predict it was a boring race on Twitter, as you know, I get criticised a lot. But, you know, it's funny, I tweeted the next day how exciting, what a brilliant Grand Prix it was. Nobody seemed to retweet that, that I'd actually said it was a brilliant Grand Prix. But it was. <laughs> Full of drama, you know, and uh, McLaren's Twitter's great. Full of negativity. That's why people love to jump on the negativity. It, it, it's it's full of full of measured criticism of events. <laughs> One can't this horrible modern day world where everything's wonderful. Everything's wonderful. Everything's wonderful. You know, Zoe Ball, you mad. Two in the morning. Oh, it drives brilliant. me brilliant. mad. I only had oh. this conversation today. Everything's not every wonderful. record. Sometimes this release for everyone. Every record release is the most brilliant record. Every TV show is the most brilliant, funny TV <laughs> show. Oh. Sometimes things aren't good. Sometimes you know, life's a bit dark and a bit hard. It's, but everyone thinks it has to be rosy these days. It's not. And uh, yeah, so good. I'm with you there. We're yeah, stupid chicanes. Perez, Perez didn't give a place back. Stupid chicanes. You know, they've got to be stronger. As soon as someone shortcuts a chicane and takes a position, tell them to get immediately. You can't be allowed to have two or three laps on the Perez radio. What was Perez thinking, though? What were, they, what, were, what were the Red Bull engineers thinking? What was Perez thinking? Obviously, well, it's he always place back. It's always, it's, always, it's always the, on the radio. He put me there. He put me there. <laughs> well, if you go around the outside of someone into a really... They're probably going to put you there. You know, that's that's motor racing. You know, Is it so. me, or have there been more handbags in this season than that <laughs> before? Because... Are you allowed to say handbags anymore? Well, in this very, oh, I doubt it. I doubt oh, it. I'll probably, I I'll probably offended a load of. I probably. Offended. I used to have a handbag. Well, they were, you must have had one back I in the nineties. I had a man little bag. handbag. Yeah, me too. Handbags. They were okay, bad. handbag really or handbag, hand. or or those are. I call mine. A, I call mine a handbag. I had my a cigarettes and I was a smoker. We had my passport, money. They were very handy things. My daughter I might get one would, again. Actually, my daughter would say a bag. Dad, why don't you just call it a dad? A bag. <laughs> Why does it have to be a man no. bag or, or a... I, or I a never had a bum bag, though. Never had a bum bag. It was always uh -huh. a holding. Or for... Um, um, uh, if we have any American uh, listeners or viewers, it's a fanny pack. Oh. We did, uh, your bum's your fanny in America. I know, I know, I know, I know. You know, I actually have a great T-shirt with Tiff, a beautiful caricature of a, of a posterior, and then an apostrophe S, Tiffany's. <laughs> One of my favourite T-shirts. Uh... Anyway... Ferrari had a bit of an average weekend, you know, not quite back on it, so, but they were up there. Leclerc thought it was one of his best races. It was very close, all the, all the safety cars and pace cars. Stroll a good seventh, uh, Alonso eighth. George, back in the points, George Russell, that was all, you know, it, well, nobody watched anything else. <laughs> George Russell having a good night, Doc on tenth. Do you, know, um, do you know all I could think when I saw the two championship leaders go out? I, all I could think was... Freddie Chip, Chidix, Jeff Newman, Caterham Championship. <laughs> Me in third place, going through for the win. That's all I could think. How bad is okay. that? Terrible. No, in your dreams. In um, your dreams. I actually thought Bottas was win. I thought Valtteri, you know, who, who, who's got this new engine in that gave him the pole position and then came from right at the back of the grid. <laughs> I thought he was going to win. It's funny how it, you, can, you can overtake sort of midfielders with incredible ease. But as soon as you come up to someone that's only half a second or one second and slower than you, it just suddenly becomes impossible. It's, it's quite frustrating because he stormed past, you know, so many of the midfielders and then just got stuck in the end and couldn't make any more moves. But, but don't but, um, you think that if that was Lewis, he would have won the race from where Bottas was, given the circumstances? Don't you think that's what Bottas is, leaving Mercedes? Don't you think if George Russell was in that seat, he probably would have run the, won the race? Probably, because he wasn't far behind Lando, was he, when he came out? Lando was just ahead uh, when he came out of the pit. So, yeah, Lewis could have won it. Could, could, if, 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 if. Ifs if. and buts. It's all ifs and buts. But it was exciting. It was a good race. It was good for Formula 1. Two weeks' time, yeah. we're going to Russia. So that would be exciting as well. So uh, they got a, a, a week off to, uh, to think about yeah. what possibly, what went wrong. But um, in terms of support racing, there was an F2, of course. Which... Yeah, um, um, sprint race, firstly. Didn't oh. quite work. Again... You've got to choose circuits that aren't silly. So I'm sorry, 
the whole thing of these tight chicanes at Mons, it becomes a lottery. You know, the first call, any one of the entire field could have a silly wing knock through no fault of their own, and you're out of the race. That's why I hate about Monza's first quarter. Maybe the first lap they should go full throttle and not go through the silly chicane. <laughs> but then, then they'd arrive at the second with chicane about That's 200 miles an hour. Idea. That's not a bad idea, though. I quite um, like that idea. Well, he actually needs... I've actually thought of another radical plan of mine. I had these brilliant plans. You should actually start on the back straight, which leads into the Parabolica, which they've now named the Alberetto corner. Much as I admire Michele Alberetto, I'm sorry, Monza, you can't <laughs> rename the Parabolica. Alberetto, all due respect, wonderful driver. But anyway... The parabolic is the sort of first corner you need. It's down to about third gear, well, fifth gear, probably the Formula One car. But you can go around side by side and then get into single file, and that is the perfect first corner. Um, but a silly chicane corner. So someone, and unfortunately it was Pierre Gasly, who qualified a wonderful fourth, would have had a great weekend, and that was the one that lost the lottery of the sprint race. And from then on, not, nothing much will happen. Everyone was pretty strung out. I mean, the, the, there was a good battle between the... Um, Aston's wasn't it and the um the Alpines had a good old battle in the middle but that was about it but so I a pretty I... dull sprint race didn't work at Monza boys pick your tracks better hang on now I'm confused we're talking we're talking we're going back to the sprint we're going back a day earlier of course well the that sprint. was a support race so it's a support race that's what I'm sorry sorry have I lost you? Yes. We're, we're talking about support races but the, the, but the sprint race for Formula One Again, I think you mentioned this before, I think it's wrong because, uh, so Lewis had a bad start in the sprint, so ended up finishing fourth. Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't mind that losing a few places. It's when, when it's got a track where you can have your wings taken off, you know. Yeah, but Tiff, silly surely if you get pole position on the sprint, you should also, have, that pole position should carry through, irrespective of where your sprint result ends, shouldn't that pole position carry through to the race day on the Sunday? Well, you mean Bottas should be put at the back of the field for the sprint race, you're saying? No, what I'm saying is Lewis qualified second, should have been second on the grid, i.e. first on the grid, because Bottas went to the back. Or do you think it should? the sprint race is all about that and that is where your result ends up? Oh, no, no. If you have sprint races, it has to be to create the grid for the Grand Prix. OK, fair enough. Well, what I'm saying is sprint races must be chosen at circuits where there isn't a huge likelihood <laughs> of, of someone losing out by the first chicane lottery. That's why I hated Monza as a, a sprint race. And however much you try and avoid that, when you're in the middle of the pack, you can't avoid it. It's impossible. No, you're, I mean, yeah, three cars just, a breadth, you can't. And it is. Well, it's, it's 20 Rolls Royce Phantoms arriving at a, a roundabout together, you know. It's while incredible. Someone's going to hit some. Oh, no, they're so they're two metres yeah. wide. Get a tape measure and look at how big two metres is. Two metres wide for a car. Incredible. 18 foot long? Mm -hmm. Longer, anyway. Anyway, so sprint, sprint races, former two sprint races, they were as chaotic as ever, thanks to the layout of the track. Poor old Dan Tick them. I don't, didn't think I'd ever no, say I that. Say, I'll come to Dan because, yeah, because <laughs> I mean, poor Cher won one of the sprint races. Um, yeah, he had Daruva, the Indian guy, won the other one again, sprint races, a bit of a lottery. Um, and the main race was run by the fastest guy in qualifying, Oscar Piastri, the pole um, city Aussie. Um, and he actually got up to fourth from 10th reverse grid race up to fourth in one. But anyway, Oscar Piastri deservedly won uh, the main event. But yes, <laughs> Dan ticked. Actually, bless Dan. He's come out after his weekend and said, you know, I've screwed my career up. You know, I know it's me. I can't keep your mouth shut. <laughs> That's probably a problem. I'm probably maybe what my problem has been in the past. But um, <laughs> and he actually admitted, you know, oh, he's lost. He's gutted and, you know, he's, he's not going to get a Williams drive now. And he knows why. And he's, he's almost said if he can't get a paid drive, he'll just sort of give it up and do something else. But he what had a, a shame. classic tick to weekend. What a shame. Somebody so talented. And there, oh, no. there we say... The 16 mm -hmm. fastest women in the world. Oh, it's an awkward thing to say, but it, you know, Dan yeah. ticked him. You put him in with those 16 women. What's going to happen? I, it's well, it's, he beat them. He, he, yeah. he, but he beat most former. I mean, he qualified eighth, you know. And uh, he's a brilliant driver. But but he was out on the second lap of the first sprint race, and because he, he that wasn't his fault. He was taken out, you know, when he was trying to come up to the field. And the uh, most so frustrating, the second, and the most frustrating back. thing ever, not just was taken out, so he span around. If you didn't see it, Dan was span around, but then yeah. <laughs> he was still on the track, so he could have rejoined at any time. Yeah, but there was, there was this off. crocodile going through, and he literally had to wait for every single car to go <laughs> before he go. Poor lad. They'd already taken his nose off. Man, well, the second sprint race, he got up from the back of the grid to eleventh, which meant nothing, no points. <laughs> 
Uh, and then in the main race, he started from his qualifying position of eighth. And uh, he actually, because he stayed out, he started on the uh, medium tyres, the yellow tyres, which most people went um, red first, yellow second. Uh, so he was actually leading when they all pitted. And then the pace car came out so he could do his tyre swap. So he, he then came out on the fast. It was a great bit of strategy. It was more luck strategy. It was like a throw a, you know, throw a dice thing. Um, and he came up from 11th to 3rd in those last few laps. In fact, there hadn't been a pace car for the last couple of laps. He might have won the thing. So it was great to see him on the podium. I, mean, I You sort of got to love him. He's, he's, he's made all the mistakes. He shot himself with the foot with both barrels of his entire career. <laughs> But at least he's now sort of owned up and he said, you know, I'm trying to change, but, you know, that's me. And, you know, obviously me's not suited to being a Grand Prix driver. But, I, don't, um, I, don't, I like drivers wearing their hearts on the seat, but I don't like drivers that always is woe is me. And I'm, I'm, the, mm. I, I'm always the one that gets, yeah. You know, There's a bloke crash. in Catrums. I've seen these onboards. <laughs> Every time he gets into a crash, it's always everybody else. Oh, blah, blah. A lot anyway, of swear in anyway, as well. Where, where are we going next? Uh, Paul, <laughs> just mention Paul. One, another support race, the, uh, the I don't know what it's called a world championship. Probably not. The Porsche, the support 911 Porsche championship. Um, incredibly good. Harry King, our British UK champion, who I think is one of the great talents of the future in uh, in perhaps Le Mans sports cars in Porsche go that way. Well, they are going that way in the future. But he got his best result, came to the sixth from 11th on the grid. Um, to Harry King, good to see a young Brit in that uh, may have a very, very tricky series to win in Porsches. Well, Nick Tandy did it many years ago uh, and is now, you know, a very successful paid driver. So an, uh, an exciting weekend at Monza. As always, nice to be in Italy. Not that I was there. I, <laughs> no, I, could... I wish, wish we were. Um, what about MotoGP? Was that, it was got a bit of an Italian yeah. thing because we've got the Italian uh, Ducati and uh, Francesco yeah. Baganini. Is that how you pronounce Bagnaia, it? Bagnaia, Bagnaia. Bagnaia, Bagnaia. yeah. Bagnaia. Amazing. It was a fantastic race. Bagnaia. A two-bike race towards the end out in Aragon in, in Spain. A circuit which I know everyone loves riding, but it's a circuit every time I watch it on the television. If you sort of looked in halfway through a lap, you'd have no idea which corner they're on. It's just a never-ending S bends and turns and uh, then one huge long straight. But it was a fabulous but Mark Marquez, who's it's almost his hometown, I think, you know, and he's still coming back from that terrible injury. He had a terrible silver stone when he took whoever it was out on the, on the first lap and himself as well. Um, but he had this wonderful battle. And Mark, he knew he'd do something. Last lap, he, he got in the lead once on the penultimate lap. Halfway around the last lap, he still made just an impossible outbreaking manoeuvre, a shot off the road. Uh, and Bagnaia then had an easy run to the finish. But it was just a great MotoGP race. Um, They're always good. They're always exciting, aren't they? Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, not always. I mean, like I said, Silverstone was like disappointing. Hey, that's true. Rare, that so. was a procession. Never, you see, never say everything's brilliant. You're catching it, aren't you? You've just said they're always great. They're not always great. Not everything's great always. <laughs> <laughs> um, our two Brits didn't fare that well. Our two uh, Yamaha substitutes, uh, Cal Crutcher, they're both in on a sort of race-by-race -race basis with the Yamahas. Um, Cal on the factory Yamaha, uh, he finished at the 16th in the end. And poor Jake Dixon on the um, the sister bike to Valentina Rossi. Uh, he was out in the gravel on about the second or third lap, um, which was a shame for Jake, who's dreaming of being a MotoGP, and that probably hasn't done him any good. Mm. Um, but it's a tricky track. I mean, he was one of many to go down at the weekend. The Moto2s were throwing their bikes up the road nonstop, including, sadly, someone who has a bit of a reputation, which is Sam Lowe's, our British star, was on pole, uh, and was hanging on in second place. He wasn't quite in touch with a gap to the leader, uh, but he dropped it. The front, it's that front folds underneath. How they do it, bikes, because they can't. There's so little feel because you, they trail brake in, slowly releasing the amount of front brake they've got on. If you just leave a bit too much front brake on as you get to the apex, boom, down it goes and you're sliding on your bum. Um, Incredible. And quite, Incredible a, skill. quite a lot did that in Moto 2. Of course, John McPhee was promoted for a temporary run in by the same team that has a Moto2 team. So he finally had a Moto2 uh, Moto debut, qualified 29th, a minute right at the back almost, but only one and a half seconds off pole. So it's so tight, Moto2. Uh, and he came through the finish 20th at the end, had a steady run, one would say. Uh, but with him being there in Moto2, there was nobody in Moto3 for Britain. Uh, and our two championship contenders... Pedro Acosta made his first mistake ever in his life, according to us all. Uh, this incredible kid that's leading the championship just made a move up the inside and the front tucked. He made it, it was too much, 
too tight to the corner. Down he went. But it was amazing because his championship chaser, Sergio Garcia, who was then going to make more points. And the commentators would say, don't tell him our Costa's down, you know, make him keep his own race. I would have told him quickly, you know. But he dropped yeah. it with about two laps to go. Yeah. So um, a Costa championship lead was not damaged. But yeah, the two top... Like, you imagine the two top racing drivers finished like... Lewis is leading Max Verstappen, and Matt Lewis on his own falls off the road with five laps to go. And then why Max, wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you tell your driver? Why wouldn't you tell your rider? Yeah. Well, sometimes it does their little ends. When you're in a Moto Three pack, they're racing in these packs of eight to ten. I mean, there's so much going on in their in their lives for every corner down every straight that maybe uh, trying to let him know. But they do hang the big boards out, don't they? Huge boards, you know, plus point three. And then maybe they did tell him. It was say the commentator said, you know, hope he hasn't been told. But what, um, yeah, what would you say? What would you say on your pit board for uh, for Costa being off his well, bike? Costa out. They used to, <laughs> Costa out. out Thumbs say. down. Out. out. Oh yeah, you're right. Uh, would, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to Greece World Rally um, Championships. Pretty dull, actually, Tiff. I've got to say. I know. I would, I'm sorry, I would to be, I, fans. I would love to I be know, excited no. about it, but it was it, it was just nothing. It is. Just, <laughs> I really wanted to because because these are some of the best drivers in the world. The biggest kahunas of any drivers in the world as well. well the trouble is there's only there's only like eight eight in the in the top class and, and the Fords aren't quick enough so it means only about six that can win the rally before it even starts you know and as soon as a couple of those which sadly included Elford Evans uh, who had a gearbox problem and then uh, Thierry Nouvelle who had uh, what was it power steering problems so we lost two so you're down to about only four that are going to win. So the even rally I would anyway. have got a good finish if I had a. Yeah, yeah, maybe even you would have got a podium. Uh, it's <laughs> such an amazing skill what they do, and each car, but they, they're so fast, they're so high tech now. And there's these little tiny shopping trolley cars, you know, which I think is a problem because they they go sideways and forwards and backwards at the same speed. They don't know what they're doing, but <laughs> it's it's hard to communicate that on television. There's not enough drivers in it. There's not enough, you know, categories. But doesn't um, the onboard show that? Because some of the onboards are just like, oh. wow, what is, how are they keeping it on the road? It's just incredible. Then, and yet the drivers are so calm. You know, that's the I good know. one. It doesn't, it doesn't look like they're doing 100 miles an hour between trees and listening to a bloke telling you what the corner is five corners ahead. I mean, it's, it's an outstanding skill. And of course, this 20 year old, uh, Kalia Rosenbera, who came back and joined the team, um, he got the lead on about the fourth stage and never looked back. And again, a rallying problem. He wasn't sweeping the road. This is always the problem. So Robin Perry had a good start position because he wasn't. He's not done a whole championship, and so the championship leaders, Ogier's out first on the loose stuff, sweeping the road. And so, you know, I mean, it doesn't take anything away from Kelly's performance as a twenty-year-old with such limited experience. He absolutely dominated the rally, um, but he did have that small grip advantage on the first day, which means so much if you get that lead. Um, you know what, Tanak came through a second. He's normally a pacer in the high end, but he could get answer of Ampera. Sebastian Auger looks like he's edging towards his eighth Champion. championship. Um, he was third. Danny Sordo is never really that brilliant and loose. He's a more of a, a tarmac specialist. In the other high end, I was fourth. But um, Gus Greensmith had a solid fifth, another fifth place for Gus in his Ford. I mean, he's doing well. He's a, he, I'd call him a privateer. You know, he's probably brought his own money to, to get the ride, but you know, he was nearly six minutes. Uh, behind Cali Rovan Pera. So they were just spread out from about the fourth stage onwards and with uh, Newville and Evans having problems. I mean, Evans did well to come back to sixth. Um, but a little shout out, I did notice that second in the G GT3, I was going to say WRC3, was uh, Chris Ingram and Ross Whittock, who uh, they finished 11th overall. They found fun funding them own rallying and getting out there and doing things as a Skoda. So it's still great to see some Brits that deserve our, our round of applause and attention for, you know, trying to make it up that rally ladder. But with so few factory cars now, I can't see them whether Chris is going to get, you know, get the point. It's a bit like Formula One, you know, there's hardly any spaces. It's so hard. And that's, that's when you've got, you know, 20 cars on the grid, but when you've only got six cars uh, or eight cars at the most, you know, there's not, not many chances. Yeah, but, um, Absolutely. Okay, well, enough of World Rally. I think we, we've uh, hyped that up enough. Um, <laughs> back over to the UK, we had um, British Superbikes. Oh, there's a couple of big old crashes. Uh, One really yeah. bad crash. <laughs> Awful. Really good entertainment, as always. British GT up at Alton Park. I mean, it's just so spectacular. Yeah, you Lamborghinis, Bentleys, Porsches. So we, Yes, they are spectacular. I love that 
class so it looks fantastic but but, but on the superbike side of things it's funny because the Silverstone uh, a few weeks ago when you went wasn't it, it was a different class obviously different different type of bike but this British Superbikes was actually quite entertaining, wasn't it? Around Silverstone. Yeah, very close, very close. We had, well, we had this famous clash again between the teammates, uh, which was a repeat of in 2019 because it's the two... Um, <laughs> it's, it's, what's, it's, it's the two kids. I found Taz McKenzie, one of the sons of McKenzie. GMC uh, Yamaha, and, was it? Was it? Is that what you called they're, them? They're the, they're the Yamaha teammates. And yeah. they had this... When, when McKenzie was a junior boy and Ozzy O'Halloran, was leading. Uh, Taz on the inside of the second luff, he was stuck it up the inside and took them both out. Huge controversy. This was two years ago now. And um, they, they still remember that incident. The team couldn't believe it. But on this occasion, Taz and O'Hallow were a great first race. I mean, it's an amazing battle for the lead. And, and Taz McKenzie actually outside of um, Brooklyn's, isn't it? Someone else had a crash there into someone. No, I can't <laughs> I remember who that, who that must be. Anyway, <laughs> Taz came up the inside of O'Hallor with two laps to go to take the lead. Well, this okay, he didn't hit O'Hallor, but he tried to squeeze the throttle to get ahead before the Luffields, and it just the back lit up and it high sided him. And he and his bike fell right in front of O'Hallor and his teammate, oh, and then went over the top. Oh, yeah. It's a terrible looking son. I thought he was going to put um, his hand so was... in the wheel, though, and the wheel's turning around. Oh, no. Because he went, oh, oh no. it was horrible to watch. But of course, they just get but up. It didn't and matter. It happened. Because they were back the next day. They finished yeah. first and second in race two, and first and second in race three, with Amazing. Taz winning one and, and O'Hallor winning the other. So um, the only one smiling with that first race crash was Glenn Irwin, who on his Honda. And his first win. He now joins the... They do a NASCAR system in Superbikes, British Superbikes. That's the end of the regular season. Uh, now only eight riders can win the championship. The points are reset. They've got bonus points from early race wins. So they do a NASCAR system. So uh, British Superbikes, I think it's about three rounds to go. It should be really exciting. Same with British GT. They've only got one round to go. All very tight. Uh, but if you do ever want to watch British GT, it's not on telly, but it is on the website. The link is live on, on YouTube. And they had towards the end of race two, Dennis Lind and his Lamborghini chasing, I forget who it was, in the Mercedes. And they had a lot of onboard. And it was brilliant. Him trying to work his way around, pressurising it. Just as a racing driver, it was a great image because it stayed on board for that one race for very few outside it's shots. It's really nice you know, to watch on board. There's something fascinating yeah. about yeah. on board of any good yeah. racing driver. And it's good to see the lines. I tell you what, let's move on. And we we did mention the GTs uh, back in uh, the UK as well. Let's move over the pond to IndyCar no, because they show a lot no, of no, Bombard. Go not, on then. You can't leave. Can't, because I forgot, I forgot his name two weeks ago to my <laughs> huge embarrassment. Because Alex Walker, who impressed me so much that Brands Caterham race with an outside manoeuvre at Panicle Bend, I've been in touch with since. Uh, and of course, when we talked about the W Series, if only he had, you know, $100,000. He won two of the Formula Ford races at Alton Park in the conditions. And the third race was a reverse grid, so he didn't win that one. So Alex Walker, come on, real talent, English single seat. How old is pro. Alex? Do you know? Is he a young lad? He's about 17, 18. I think he's wow. just about to go to the university. Get or behind so, him. Somebody, please. Somebody must two, get two behind wins. him. Uh, so, so let's yeah, go. Alex, remember his name. Alex Walker. I will not forget that. Uh, <laughs> Alex, Alex Walker. IndyCar just seems so dull. Are, are you? Are you okay. Yeah. Well, again, again, you see, you see, I don't always, I know I like to, Yeah. All right. All right. All right. And I'm back off. Yes. I always say what you do. And the you funniest both, thing is with yeah, IndyCar, right, no, no. when they show the commercial breaks that are going on in America, they will just show. Well, however long the commercial break is of two minutes of just the on car going. Meh. Yeah. All right. It was dull. Okay. It all, was dull. Right. Yeah, all right. Not saying every indicator. Talk us through it. Well, it's it's a track. Unfortunately, it's every year. You know, Porton is one of those circuits. It looks fantastic to drive on, but it has very limited overtaking. Um, and it just ends up being processional and tactical tyres using the reds and the blacks. Mm. But also, also, all also has a stupid first corner. So a bit like. Um, Monza, but not actually as tight. But it, it's worse in a way because they come down. They come down the drag strip of an airfield. Uh, they all have to peel right. And lap one, they all half of them didn't break enough. Is it as um, bad one, as is it as bad one, as Croft? <laughs> no, no, worse. But one notable culprit was, of course, Roman Grosjean, who probably broke the least before turn one. Having never raced there before, he was he was back to his old bad boy at Spa days. 
and he clobbered. Oh, it was it was mayhem at turn one. And then when they all reset the tyres and the strategy, and Alex Palou came out and won it the was, race to space. It, it was done. What, right. what about Callum Mylot? The, the Ferrari, Ferrari boy, Callum Mylot, who's a brilliant yes. driver. He's looking at a career because he couldn't get a Formula One drive. So Callum's done a good theory of going over, having a look at America now to see if he can get an IndyCar drive. It's not a top team he's with. And he qualified right towards the back and had an average race and then it broke down. Um, but at least he's every looks at IndyCar. Well, then not every race is that exciting. It's a fantastic opportunity for drivers to get a professional career. As with Jack Harvey, who we mention every time we have IndyCar. And he had one of his better races, finished fourth. Max Chilton qualified 11th, was good for him, but dropped to 19th in the end. Um, so, yeah, OK, it wasn't... Nor was the NASCAR that exciting this week so, in the so, Hyper, OK. So, a big first corner chicane pile-up with IndyCar. NASCAR also lacked a few fireworks. I think yes. you'll agree with me there, Tiff Nadell. All right, OK. okay. <laughs> Let's move on now to next weekend now, quickly. <laughs> what have we got next weekend? Um, we got IndyCar, but Laguna Seca. But it's another track that's not much overtaken, actually. It's another tricky, but spectacular, more spectacular Portland, because everyone knows about the big, what's it called, the Big Dipper, not the Big Dipper. The Corkscrew? The Corkscrew. Well done. Uh, so that'd be great for IndyCar. They've got two rounds left, and after um, Portland, uh, Palo is now closer to, to O'Ward in the McLaren car, who's leading the championship. Uh, American Joseph Newgarten's closer. Exciting championship-wise, uh, two rounds to go in IndyCar. MotoGP is going to be entertaining us all at San Marino, Imola. So that's obviously a weekend of fabulous racing at Imola. World Superbikes, the battle between Ray and Raz Gatliogu. Well, I've always got that one. You've got it, you've uh, got it. They, they continue Barcelona in their great battle for the title. NASCAR, of course, uh, going round and round. As the, as the, as it's the end of the first three races now before they, they lose four drivers uh, in their knockout situation. Whereas back home, fantastic entertainment again the weekend, BTCC up at Croft. I uh, will predict now there are going to be bumper cars on the first corner, on the first... No, well, yeah. There will be bumper cars. The, be more, the more you become a racing driver and know about circuits, the more annoying you become, <laughs> to be honest. But we won't go through that. Are you going to drive up there at four o'clock in the morning to watch BTCC in your catering? I've never seen BTCC live, actually. Well, well then say. you should drive up in the, on Sunday morning <laughs> in your catering. You've done it once. Why not do it again? I'll tell you what I am doing. I, why I can't go on Saturday is because I'm marshalling at Castle Coombe. I'll have you know I'm part of the Orange Army. So you're not coming to support me then at Glorious Goodwood. I've come to your catering race. I'm to coming to watch you. you on Friday at Goodwood. I'm looking forward to watching you on Friday at Goodwood. All I do on Friday is qualify my Mark 7 Jag. I mean, this tank, I love my tank. I'm a huge Mark 7 Jag. Uh, but luckily on the Sunday, I've got the uh, Tourist Trophy race and John Spears' E-type, lightweight E-type. So Goodwood is, I mean, it's just, it, it's the race. Glorious the Goodwood. Goodwood. It is, I cannot wait. And before we leave, and before we leave you, uh, anyone that stayed on this long, thank you very much. Anyone that's watched, thank you so much. Um, we want to say a special unmotor motor racing uh, mention to Emma related. Radu, um, related, thank you, Emma Radicanu. So, um, that, what a, if you like sport, well, if you just like life, you've got to appreciate uh, what this British teenager did winning as a qualifier the New York Open Tennis Championship. One day who's going to win the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't think Lewis, of any favourites to win. Now. Lewis Hamilton, if he gets his eighth uh, championship. He won't. He won't. Nobody is going to be God. Emma, and no. quite <laughs> rightly too, she's got my vote. Well Absolutely done, tremendous. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. See you soon.